Hello YouTube. Today I want to talk about animal minds. Uh, by this I mean non-human animals. Humans are of course animals, but in this video we're talking about all the other animals. Uh, obviously this is a, a big a big topic. Um, I want to focus on the question, do animals have minds? And if so, to what extent uh, are their minds like ours? I think it's fair to say that the intuition is that animals have minds that are simpler than ours, but still basically like ours. Animals are conscious, they have beliefs, desires, goals, they experience sensations like pain and hunger and thirst, they have emotions. Um, some animals seem to engage in reasoning. Uh, there are lots of videos on YouTube showing uh, crows and dogs and monkeys and so on working out problems. Um, but there have been philosophers who've claimed that animals don't have minds, or at least that animal minds are far less sophisticated than we usually assume. One of the uh, central methodological principles in the study of animal psychology is Morgan's Canon, which says that animal behaviour should not be interpreted in terms of higher psychological processes, if it can be fairly interpreted in terms of processes which stand lower in the scale of psychological evolution and development. So there's a danger of... Um, of sort of anthropomorphizing animals, of attributing to them human qualities that they actually lack, and um, you know, part of the point of this kind of, of this Morgan's canon is uh, to guard against that. Um, so, with this kind of with this canon in mind, um, one way to motivate scepticism of animal minds is to consider certain interesting cases of humans. Think about sleepwalking. In cases of sleepwalking, people can engage in very complex behaviours. Um, they will maybe go, they'll walk around, for one thing, and they will avoid bumping into objects. Um, they can engage in conversation. Uh, I think they can even do things like cook a meal. Um, but very plausibly, they're not conscious, or at least there's a very diminished kind of consciousness. Um, another famous example in the philosophical literature is... Uh, uh, consider a truck driver driving down one of those long, straight American roads. We don't really have roads like this in the UK, but in, in America and Canada and other places, they have roads that are very long and straight and flat for miles and miles and miles. And driving down a road like this, people can often switch off. They, uh, they in a sense, lose consciousness. They can still drive perfectly well, they perform the right manoeuvres, but it all happens automatically. This is called highway hypnosis. Uh, the driver is performing a complex action, but with apparently diminished mentality. So what these examples suggest is that the very robust minds that we have, this kind of full awareness and consciousness and richness of experience, none of that's actually necessary for engaging in uh, very complex activities. So we have to be careful about inferring from behaviour to mentality especially with organisms that are very different from ourselves. Obviously none of this is conclusive, it's just a bit of motivation to be sceptical about animal mentality. So let's look at some more ambitious arguments. Donald Davidson uh, denies that animals think. Um, specifically, he, uh, he denies that they have any propositional attitudes. So a propositional attitude is just a mental state taken towards a proposition. Um, Frank believes that Obama is the President of the United States. Vincent desires that his diastolic blood pressure stays below 80. Susie fears that Ebola will spread to Europe. Joe hopes that an Ebola vaccine is developed in time. So we have a proposition such as Ebola will spread to, to, to Europe and we take a certain mental stance towards it. Um, beliefs, desires, hopes, uh, fears, wishes, thoughts and so on, those are all propositional attitudes. Um, obviously they're a very big part of our mental lives. Uh, and Davidson um, denies that, that animals have propositional attitudes. Um, specifically, he focuses on beliefs, um, although you know, the, the arguments can, can be extended, but we'll, we'll look at his points about beliefs specifically. So the natural assumption is that animals have beliefs. A famous example um, is uh, Fido the dog is chasing a cat, the cat runs up the tree, and Fido stands at the bottom of the tree barking. Uh, so, so the cat's disappeared, Fido can't see the cat, so he's not just sort of reacting to an immediate perception or anything. I think we'd be inclined to say that Fido believes that the cat is in the tree, and that's why he's standing at the bottom of the tree barking. 
And notice that all we're doing here is explaining Fido's behaviour in the same way we, we would explain a person's. If Fido was a human rather than a dog, so Fido the human is chasing a cat, the cat runs up the tree and Fido tries to get up the tree, well, it would be completely uncontroversial to say that Fido believes the cat is in the tree. Now, Davidson um, has, I think, three basic objections to this uh, kind of explanation when it comes to animals. Uh, his arguments are a bit unclear at times, but I think this is the standard way of interpreting them. First of all, Davidson appears, appeals to the granularity of belief. Beliefs are more fine-grained than facts. Two beliefs can be different even though they describe exactly the same fact, the same state of affairs in the world. So consider uh, that uh, John believes that Captain Beefheart wrote Trout Mask Replica, and John believes that Don Van Vliet wrote Trout Mask Replica. Well, the first sentence might be true, but the latter sentence might be false, because John might be unaware that Don Van Vliet is Captain Beefheart's real name. So we have two beliefs. Captain Beefheart wrote Trout Mask Replica, and Don Van Vliet wrote Trout Mask Replica. Now these beliefs, they, they describe exactly the same fact in the world. They're both made true by exactly the same fact, but clearly they're different beliefs. You know, a person could have one without the other. So beliefs are very uh, fine-grained. They're more fine-grained than facts. So let's go back to Fido. What does Fido believe? Well, we'd probably be inclined to say that he believes the cat ran up the tree. But notice there are many other beliefs we might attribute to Fido. Why not the cat run up the tallest object in the garden? Or the cat ran up the leafy thing? The crucial point here is that you know, the cat ran up the tree and the cat ran up the tallest object in the garden are not the same beliefs, even though they might describe the same fact. So which one should we attribute to Fido? Well, there doesn't really seem to be any fact of the matter here. Um, uh, I suppose we might try to say that Fido has both beliefs. Maybe he believes both that the cat ran up the tree and that it ran up the tallest object in the garden. But again, that just seems completely unmotivated. Um, there's no way of determining uh, what belief we should attribute to Fido. The only way we could do this is if we were able to, to sort of listen to what Fido says. You know, if he says, oh, the cat's up the tree, then we'd say he believes that the cat's up the tree and not the cat's up the tallest object in the garden. But obviously Fido isn't saying anything because he's a dog. So Davidson's point here is Fido can't have beliefs about the tree unless there's some description of the tree that captures how Fido thinks of the tree. But no, no description that we can come up with would suit Fido. And obviously the same is true of everything else there. You know, he can't have beliefs about a cat unless there's some description of the cat that captures how he thinks of the cat. But again, no description that, that we could come up with would, would suit him. All the descriptions uh, we, we could give would be in um, human language, and obviously that wouldn't be appropriate for a dog. OK, so some problems for this argument. Well, first of all, I mean, as a number of philosophers have pointed out, even if this argument is successful, what it shows is that we can't attribute specific beliefs to animals. It doesn't justify the stronger conclusion that animals have no beliefs, period. So what we can say is that Fido doesn't have any beliefs that are expressible in human language. He doesn't believe the cat is up the tree, but doesn't follow that he has no beliefs. Uh, second, more importantly, Fido may have a belief very similar to the cat is up the tree. He may have a belief that can uh, reasonably tr be translated as the cat is up the tree. So it's obviously when we talk about Fido, uh, when, we, when we describe Fido, we can only use our own language to do so. And equally obviously that's not going to perfectly capture what's going on in his mind. Um, but I think we can be confident that we've at least approximated what's going on in his mind and that's good enough. So think about translating between human languages. I've heard that the uh, the Inuit have something like 200 words for snow. Uh, now, I don't know if that's true or if that's just an urban legend, but it's certainly plausible. Um, I'm guessing that since they live in an environment of constant snow, they probably have more ways of thinking about snow than we do. So um, some, some words for snow by Kate Bush. I don't know the Inuit words for snow, but Stella Tundra, Ida Falls, Alba Dune, Boomeranga Blanca, Wenceslas is there, right? So there's just some, some words for snow. So I say snow is white, and the Inuit have to translate this into their language. Now, how do they know whether I'm talking about Stella Tundra or Ida Falls? 
Well, maybe there are some contextual clues. I mean, let's say, for instance, that Stellar Tundra is hard snow and Ida Falls is soft snow. Well, then I might have said more things about the snow that make it clear whether I'm, I have in mind hard or soft snow. And so they then, they, they then can decide whether to translate snow is white, in, you know, it might word snow into Stellar Tundra or Ida Falls. But I might just say the sentence, snow is white, and then leave it at that. You'll encounter that quite often in philosophy. Uh, snow is white is a, a sort of standard sentence in philosophy that gets wheeled out a lot. You know, like all swans are, are white or Socrates is mortal. Um, so in this case, when I just say snow is white, there doesn't seem to be any fact of the matter, whether I'm talking about Stella Tundra or Ida Falls you know, or Albadoon or Boomeranga Blanca or Wenceslas is there or any of the other more specific kinds of snow. So the point is that when we, uh, we we often attribute beliefs to people who technically can't have those exact beliefs. The Inuit might take me to be taking about talking about Stella Tundra, or they might take me to be talking about Ida Falls, or something else. It doesn't really matter. Any of those is a, a good enough approximation. In general, how we decide uh, ex exactly which belief to attribute to a person is is largely a a, a sort of matter of convention. Um, and this is probably even the case when you're dealing with people who speak your own language. So, do you believe that the cat is up the tree, or do you believe that the cat is up the tallest object in the garden? Well, tree is simpler, and it communicates more information than the tallest object in the garden. But in principle, I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter which belief I attribute to you. And there might not be any fact of the matter what your belief is. There is. I mean, if you're chasing the cat, if you're just chasing a cat and you haven't reflected at all on your beliefs as you're doing so, then your belief might not have um, any sort of specific content. So I think that this Davidson's argument here is 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 very questionable. OK, another argument Davidson gives is the network argument. Essentially, the idea here is that having one belief depends on having a host of other beliefs, uh, a network of other beliefs. To believe that the cat is in the tree requires having a variety of other beliefs about trees in general. For instance, that they grow, that they require soil and water, that they can burn, that they have leaves, bark, needles, and so on. So imagine somebody who says the cat is up the tree. We'd attribute to them the belief that the cat is up the tree. But now suppose we ask them questions about trees. For instance, we ask, uh, is, is a tree a plant or a fungus? What things do trees need in order to grow? What colour are trees? And they're not able to answer any of these questions. Or wouldn't we be inclined to say that this person doesn't know what trees are, so they can't really have any beliefs about trees? I mean, that seems reasonably plausible to me. Um, if you haven't got... If you, if you can't tell me anything about what trees are, surely you can't, uh, you can't have beliefs about trees. Well, Davidson suggests that it's just implausible to say that dogs could have the appropriate set of, of background beliefs. Um, a dog can't draw the distinction between plants and fungi, for instance. Um, a dog doesn't know anything about what nutrients trees require or about the sort of conditions they grow best in. It doesn't know that they can burn, and so on. So, so uh, animals can't have the appropriate networks of beliefs, therefore animals don't have beliefs. Um, I think this argument is very weak. Uh, the obvious response is that animals do have belief networks. In fact, uh, their belief networks about X may be more sophisticated than the networks of humans to whom we attribute beliefs about X. I believe that leopards are large feline animals, and yet I know almost nothing about leopards. I mean, it seems very plausible to me that leopards know more about other leopards than I know about them. So if I get to have beliefs about leopards, surely they should also get to have beliefs about leopards. Um, I mean, the, the problem with Davidson's argument is that it, this the, the network requirement is just way too strict. His, his version of the network requirement is just too strict. I mean, it is true that beliefs depend on other beliefs, but it doesn't require a sort of very sophisticated network with lots of abstract, complex ideas. Sometimes our belief networks are very uh, impoverished, as my belief network about leopards is. What sort of beliefs might dogs have about trees? Well, uh, maybe that they're hard. 
Uh, if a dog has touched the trunk of a tree, it probably knows that it's hard, uh, that it can use the tree to scratch itself. Uh, it maybe knows that trees are things that are found outside. So it knows that if, if I go outside, I'll see some trees. Um, obviously, the dog isn't going to be thinking all of these things in English. Uh, it won't literally think trees are hard. But it may well have beliefs that are reasonably translated in this way. It seems to me that we can only deny that animals have belief networks if we assume that animals don't have beliefs. But obviously that would be question-begging in this context. That's precisely the point that Davidson is trying to prove. The third argument is, <coughs> is what I'll call the concept argument. Um, I should warn you, this argument is quite difficult, but um, we'll, you know, we'll see if we can explain it. The argument uh, rests on three premises. First, in order to have a belief, it is necessary to have the concept of belief. Second, in order to have the concept of, the, of belief, one must have a language. And third, animals don't have languages. Or at least they don't have the very sophisticated linguistic capabilities that humans do. They, they do communicate with each other in, in certain ways, but Davidson would resist calling that a proper language. Obviously, it follows from these premises that animals don't have beliefs. OK, so let's consider premise one. Uh, to have a belief, it's necessary to have the concept of belief. The idea here is that to have any beliefs at all, you need to know what a belief is. Um, that's, that's the concept of belief. So uh, if you've got the concept of belief, you know what beliefs are. There are many concepts. Uh, think about the concept car or the concept water. If you've got those concepts, then you know what cars and water are. Similarly, the concept of belief tells you what beliefs are. So what Davidson is saying here is that in, in order to have any beliefs at all, you need to understand what beliefs are. Now, Davidson's argument for this premise rests on the idea that belief is connected to the capacity for surprise. Essentially, the point is that if I believe that P, I should be surprised if it turns out that P isn't true. So think about discovering that there's no coin in your pocket. In one scenario, you have no prior beliefs. Somebody asks if they can borrow 50 pence. You think you're not sure if you've got 50 pence. You reach into your pocket to check and know there's nothing in there. Now, in another scenario, you believe you do have 50 pence on you. So you check your pocket and again, there's no coin. Well, that's surprising. Um, it's unexpected. It's maybe a little bit disconcerting. So what's happened here is that you're aware of a contrast between what you did believe and what you now believe. You've come to believe that your original belief was false. Right, so, so to repeat, if you believe things, you'll be subject to surprises when it turns out that those beliefs are wrong. So a, a, a surprise involves, what surprise involves is having a belief about a belief. You believe that your earlier belief was false. Now obviously if you have a belief about a belief, you must have some understanding of what beliefs are. You know, in other words, you must have the concept of belief. You can't have a belief about water without knowing what water is. Similarly, you can't have a belief about beliefs without knowing what beliefs are. Premise two says that having the con to have the concept of belief, you must have a language. So being, you know, to be able to have beliefs about beliefs, you have to have a language. The basic point here is that the concept of belief involves understanding the distinction between truth and falsity. So as a matter of definition, beliefs are states that can be true or false. Um, I can believe that my friend's belief was true, or I can believe that my earlier belief was false, etc. Um, we can't have the concept of belief, we can't understand what beliefs are, unless we understand the nature of truth and falsehood. Now, understanding the nature of truth and falsehood, in turn, requires understanding the distinction between objective and, and subjective, by which I mean an, an objective reality independent of our beliefs about it, versus our personal subjective perspective. When we say that a belief is true, we're saying it matches objective reality. When we say it's false, we're saying it fails to match objective reality. So the concept of belief uh, requires the concept of objectivity. And this is where language comes in. What's important about language, according to Davidson, is that language allows triangulation. So uh, so as I've said, the concept of belief requires understanding the distinction between objective and subjective. Now, language allows us to compare our perspective on the world with other people's perspectives. Uh, it's what allows us to appreciate that our perspective just is a perspective, you know, one perspective among many, one individual viewpoint. It allows us to make the distinction between the, the subjective, 
you know, our personal perspective and the objective, the world outside. Um, without the ability to appreciate that there are different perspectives on things, you could never come to draw that distinction. So, so imagine if we could never communicate with other people, if we could never sort of, you know, talk in a sophisticated way with other people. Well, we might, we might have expectations about the world and those expectations might turn out to be wrong. So I expect to find a coin in my pocket, I look in my pocket and there's no coin in there. Would I be able to think to myself, my original belief was false? You know, I, I believed I had a coin in my pocket and I was wrong. Well, plausibly, no, because it could simply be that the world has changed. You know, maybe I did have a coin in my pocket, but it fell out or whatever. So the point is that as long as we're limited to our own perspective, there's just no need to draw a distinction between truth and falsehood, between objective and subjective, between uh, the way the world is and the way I think the world is. Um, it's only when we encounter other people with different perspectives that this distinction is drawn. Okay, now I think this argument is extremely confusing, so it might help to diagram it, right? We've got three premises. Number one, in order to have the concept of belief, it is in order to have a belief, it is necessary to have the concept of belief. Number two, in order to have the concept of belief, one must have a language. And three, animals don't have languages. So, in favour of the first premise, Davidson suggests that beliefs are connected to the capacity for surprise. If I believe something, I'll be surprised if it turns out that my belief is wrong. But being surprised involves believing that my earlier belief was false. Uh, so uh, it involves a belief about a belief. And having a belief about a belief requires having the concept of belief. It requires knowing what beliefs are, just as in order to have beliefs about dogs, you need to know what dogs are. In favour of the second premise, Davidson suggests that beliefs necessarily, they are beliefs are states that can be true or false. So having the concept of belief, you know, knowing what beliefs are, requires knowing the distinction between truth and falsity. But we can only develop this knowledge because of language, because language uh, allows triangulation, allows us to compare our perspective with other people's perspectives. OK, so I, I hope that that's reasonably clear. As I said, it is a difficult argument, but I hope that that kind of um, puts it in, in a clear way. All right, let's consider some problems. The first premise, does belief require surprise? Well, Davidson clearly thinks that, uh, just as a conceptual matter, if you believe something and it turns out that you're wrong, you'll experience surprise. This just doesn't seem right to me. Um, we have uh, a plant downstairs in the living room. When I came home yet, uh, the other day, I assumed they were still there. I went to my bedroom, I discovered that the plants had been moved to my windowsill. That's a true story. It's not a very interesting story, but it illustrates my point. Uh, my belief that the plants were downstairs was wrong. I wouldn't say I was surprised to find them in my room. Um, I knew that the living room was being used for other things, namely a Christmas tree, so it actually made sense that the plants had been moved. Um, it seems like you know, what, what I experienced there was a change of belief, clearly, um, but it doesn't seem to me that it was surprising. It was maybe a, a little unexpected, not surprising. So I think that this strong connection that Davidson tries to draw between belief and surprise is questionable. Um, must surprise involve coming to believe the earlier belief was false? Now, must surprise involve beliefs about beliefs? Well, again, this just seems, this just seems wrong. Um, Peter Caruthers, in his article, uh, Metacognition in Animals, suggests that, that suggests that all that's necessary for surprise is a mechanism that detects conflicts between beliefs. So uh, if I believe that P, then I come to believe that not P, this activates the surprise mechanism. Um, you know, it produces that sort of state of arousal, it heightens my alertness, focuses my attention. My expectations have been confounded, that produces surprise. We don't need to suppose that surprise involves believing, uh, believing that not P and believing that my belief that P was false. It's enough that I believed that P, then I came to believe that not P. Clearly, those two judgments um, conflict, and all we need for surprise is a mechanism that detects this conflict. Um, Caruthers doesn't present any evidence that this is actually how surprise works, but then Davidson doesn't present any evidence for his account either. Um, clearly, Caruthers' account is plausible. Um, it's also rather simpler than Davidson's, and 
Uh, so I think that sheds some doubt on Davison's argument. I'd actually go further than Caruthers. I'd say that surprise doesn't require any kind of conflict of belief whatsoever. An example from Eric Schwitzgabel is that I might be surprised to win the lottery, but I won't think that any earlier beliefs were mistaken. So um, I believed that I had an extremely low chance of winning the lottery, say millions to one. Well, if I if I win, I'll clearly be surprised, but I'll still think that my uh, you know my chance of winning was millions to one. Um, my my beliefs won't have changed at all. Um, another problem for, with with Davidson's argument is. Uh, it seems that animals can experience surprise. If an animal sees something unexpected, it will act in a way that we'd call surprised. There are videos uh, of cats seeing cucumbers, and when they see the cucumber, they, they jump up, they look shocked, and they sort of cautiously prod them. They don't really know what to do with them. A natural way of describing this would be to say that they've been surprised by the cucumber. Or if a dog expects to get some food, you tease it with a biscuit and then quickly exchange the biscuit for a cardboard tube or something, it will seem surprised. So just in terms of behaviour, it, it does seem reasonable to attribute surprise to animals. And there are other reasons to think that animals experience surprise. Why do humans have the capacity to, to, for surprise? I and mean, what, what is surprise for? Why did it evolve in us? Well, a plausible story is that if your expectations turn out to be wrong, it's useful for you to have your attention uh, focused on, on that thing. Um, you, know, you need to find out more. Why have your expectations been confounded? What's changed in the environment and why has it changed? Consider hunting an animal, right? When people, you know, when, when sort of tribesmen or whatever go on a hunt, a lot of it's probably very instinctive. You know, they, they, they just kind of get into a flow and they know exactly what to look for. Um, but then if something goes, goes a little bit wrong, maybe they lose track or whatever, their attention will snap back and they'll be sort of focused on figuring out why why has this gone wrong um, or consider coming back after a hunt and finding things in your hut have have moved well you know, why have they moved has somebody come into your hut could they still be there maybe those are silly examples but you know, the point is that when expectations are confounded you could be under some sort of threat or risk um, so, I mean, for, for various reasons, it seems plausible that we evolved a mechanism for, for directing our attention when our expectations go wrong. And surprise would seem to be what plays this role. When expectations go wrong, surprise is what directs our attention um, to, you know, towards figuring out why those expectations have gone wrong. Now, evidently, um, it would similarly be very useful in the same way for animals. To develop that. So we should expect that animals uh, experience surprise just as we do. <clears throat> so I think the first premise is questionable on, on many, many grounds. Uh, the second premise, that having the concept of belief requires language, is rather more plausible. I'm not sure about Davidson's argument for it, but I mean, it, just intuitively, it does seem like belief is a more sophisticated sort of concept. Something like a tree, for instance, you can just see. So, you know, plausibly dogs have the concept tree, or at least a concept like that. Um, but beliefs, I mean, you don't, you don't see beliefs. When we attribute beliefs to others, that's uh, a matter of sometimes quite sophisticated interpretation. It's sort of like the concept of justice or number or existence. They're not necessarily ideas that you'd expect to find among animals. Still, I think we can resist this premise, at least for some animals. We can do this by adopting a weaker definition of belief. We might say that belief is just a kind of representation of the world. To believe that P is just to represent the world such that P obtains. Um, so can animals have the concept of belief in this sense? Can animals understand that other animals represent the world as being various ways? Well, there's some evidence that at least some animals can. Um, Manima Chadha, in an article called No Speech, Never Mind, goes through some of this. She points uh, to some interesting cases of, um, of deception in primates. Uh, I quote, The famous bonobo Kanzi somehow managed to get hold of the key to his own enclosure and promptly hid it. When Sue Savage Rumba started to search for the key, she invited Kanzi to help. Kanzi went through the motions of helping, pretending to search for the key, Later, when Savage Rumba gave up and things quieted down, Kanzi retrieved the key and used it to escape from the enclosure. So Kanzi is trying to deceive his owner, and 
This involves trying to influence how his owner is representing the world. Kanzi wants to prevent his owner from representing the world correctly. Uh, it, you know, or, or, or in other words, he wants to pre prevent his owner from coming to have a correct belief about where the key is. So it seems that Kanzi has some understanding that, um, you know, that there's a way that his owner is representing the world and Kanzi understands how to influence that. And of course, what's notable about this case is that it's it's very unlikely to be uh, a matter of instinct, as it were. I mean, this this isn't a behaviour that's just written into the genes. Kanzi is clearly working things out um, on his own on his own uh, terms. Uh, another case, I, I quote again: A juvenile baboon watches an adolescent laboriously digging up a tuber. Before the adolescent has a chance to destroy to enjoy the tuber, the juvenile jumps as if she has been attacked. The mother, until then out of sight, arrives, fears that the juvenile is being attacked and chases the adolescent. The juvenile is then left free to enjoy the tuber. In this example, the juvenile is influencing how its mother is representing the world. The juvenile is trying to get its mother to believe that it's under attack, so the mother will run in to try to protect it. So this evidence suggests that uh, some animals do have uh, an understanding of what beliefs are. They attribute beliefs to each other, and they act to influence each other's beliefs. Now, to be fair, it is controversial exactly how to interpret this sort of evidence, but, I mean, it does seem that, that primates understand to some degree that other creatures have different perspectives, and that these perspectives can correctly or incorrectly represent the world. So, um, uh, I would say that overall Davidson's argument uh, here strikes me as very, very tenuous, um, as do... As, as the first two do. And, I mean, bear in mind that Davidson is making a very strong claim here. I mean, prima facie, it's just completely absurd to say that animals have no beliefs. Um, I don't think that any of Davidson's arguments um, are even close to convincing. Um, but I hope that you, you found that, that interesting. In the next video, we'll take a look at Peter Caruthers and his arguments against animal consciousness. Um, and maybe more, um, not sure, haven't really thought about it yet, but that's all for now. So um, I hope that was helpful. Goodbye.